it's lovely to welcome you, and especially anyone who hasn't been here before, or anyone who is from um, a church other than the one that's here. Um, a very warm welcome. And a very warm welcome to uh, Beverly Stevens and to Flo Brockman and to Jacob Merchant, who between them are going to present the second of our then lectures. I haven't managed to find out, and I think this is probably a, a matter of principle, I haven't managed to find out much about Beverly off the internet, which is where I get all my information. <laughs> so the deal is that she's going to introduce herself. So that's all I want to say now. And Beverly, if you would like to, to, to inspire us with literature. Oh my goodness me. Yeah. Not much of a challenge this evening. Um, I am Beverly Stevens, current head teacher at Rana. I've, I've never been here before. An extraordinary place given a lovely warm welcome. One of the extraordinary building. About um, the history of the building, such a wonderful place. I wish we'd come in daylight. Uh, it's gorgeous. Now, I'm talking about coming in daylight. Uh, we're, it is an intro, we're going to have a, sort of a whistle stop tour on sale, which is about some um, like in a moment. Uh, I gather last week was absolutely fabulous, um, but the poor speaker didn't get home until 2 a.m., so do you tell me? Oh, you didn't know that. Um, <laughs> I thought you just had great questions. <laughs> 2 a.m. I'm glad. Don't ask so many questions. Please. Okay, so a tall order, I think, inspired by literature, but it's an absolute pleasure to talk about it. I started teaching, um, I was fully qualified in 1983, so I spent a long time talking about literature one way or another. Um, actually, if you love literature and you get the opportunity to teach, it's utterly self indulgent. The sad thing about being a head teacher is you don't get so much opportunity to indulge yourself. But when I nip into a classroom now and have that chance, it's absolutely wonderful. It still it inspires me, actually. So I'm really grateful to you for showing an interest in coming this evening. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, we're going to reflect somewhat, a little on Lent and what inspires us in literature. So hopefully you're in the right place, if that's what you're expecting to come and hear about. Um, and I understand that you began last week by looking at poetry. And there will segue into our talk a little bit because we'll talk about, a little bit about drama and a bit about uh, fiction. Um, but I know Flo is going to talk a little bit about poetry, which is why you've got that little flyer. Um, there isn't going to be a test at the end of it. Um, uh, but I will be interested in your questions. I'll know who's read the flyer as a result of that. Um, Flo would like to have that as a prop, really, so that she can refer to that without having to read all of the poems to you. She's got some observations to make about those. Um, so, I've got Flo, who's in year 13 with me this evening, they've agreed to come, I'm very grateful to them for doing so, and Jacob, who is in year 11, and they'll say some more about themselves when they start to talk to you. Um, I think it's suffice it to say that the way in which I've been inspired by literature is inextricably linked with being a teacher, um, and education and my experience in the classroom. So, I think possibly, also as a student of literature myself, when I was at school, so I couldn't possibly have come this evening to talk to you without reference to the experience of young people and how, what it feels like for them. And I've been fascinated to listen to what they're going to say to you. Um, I've heard them rehearsing, it's really interesting. I, I, think, I think you'll enjoy it. So earlier this year, my son sent me a WhatsApp message. I honestly have no idea why he said I thought he was thinking about a birthday present, but it wasn't. He didn't... didn't it did nothing materialised as a result of this. He asked me, what's your favourite book, Mum? Um, and because he'd asked me why I buy WhatsApp, um, and the reason you don't find me on social media, because I don't do social media, so you won't find a lot about me, but I do do WhatsApp. Um, but the great thing about it was I don't do it instantly, so it gave me some thinking time. And I thought, well, how am I going to answer that question? I mean, in fact, I actually flatly refused to answer it to begin with. Um, and in the end, I played my ace card. Um, which was to sort of draw myself up to my full height and say, I'm an English teacher, you can't possibly expect me to choose one book. Um, however, I, I gave a, a little snapshot of the sort of texts that have inspired me. I think if I want to read something lyrical and beautiful and hilarious, but also deeply moving, I might pick up, or better still perhaps listen to, um, Dylan Thomas's Under Milk Wood, a play for voices. I think it's beautiful, it's lovely every time I hear it. Um, it's got characters which I think even after 87 years, it's not believable to think it's 87 years old, um, I, think, I think they still speak to us about the human condition. If I'm feeling nostalgic, 
I might pick up Jane Eyre. I remember so vividly reading that book when I was about 12. I, I, went, I went away to school. I used to go to my grandparents for half-term holidays. And I went for one half-term, but I always picked something from my grandmother's bookshelf, and I picked Jane Eyre. And I remember waking up, or reading it, uh, by, perhaps by torchlight, uh, late at night. And those passages about Grace Poole, vividly, I, I just remember it so vividly, I was utterly terrified. I seemed, I seemed to recall actually going to my grandmother's room, getting her out of bed, um, because I was quite moved and, and terrified by the whole thing. So I feel quite nostalgic about Charlotte Bronte's work. I think another favourite that I've always enjoyed, that I came across in my early days of teaching, so perhaps there's a bit of nostalgia around that too. I don't know whether you've read it, The Siege of Krishna Paul by J.G. Farrell, a work in Tim Lord. Um, it's, it's, if you haven't read it, the novel details the siege of a fictional Indian town, um, Krishnapur, and it's during the Indian Rebellion of 1857. And it's from the perspective of the British residents who are stuck there. And the main characters find themselves subject to the increasing deprivation and challenges of the siege. And the normal structures of life um, are obviously disrupted, they're turned upside down, and the absurdity of the class system becomes the subject of considerable hilarity. It's not quite as dry as it sounds, I think it's hilarious. And I studied that book with my first A-level group, and I absolutely adored it. Um, and I think probably when you, when you study literature with young people, somehow you connect to it in a way that's lasting. But in case you think that all of the fiction that I, on uh, my little snapshot list, I mean, it changes actually, I was listening to something on the radio on the way back from my like, visitor today. I was listening on the radio and I thought, oh, why didn't I talk about that? Um, William Golding's Lord of the Flies, if you want to talk about Lent and, and theme themes and original sin, that'd be a great start. But anyway, I didn't choose it, so um, it was fine. Um, so unless you think they're all from all of my encounters with literature rooted in the dim and distant past, a perhaps more recent work of fiction, which earned a place on my list, is um, The Road. I don't know whether you've read that, the American writer Paul McCarthy. Um, quite an interesting choice. It makes it about a father and a son journey across post-apocalyptic America. And their names are never revealed in the story. They're simply called The Man and The Boy. And McCarthy's narrative is utterly sparse and yet moving. And the land he depicts is covered in ash, and devoid of life. And I think the description of the journey to the potential safety of the South Coast is, is harrowing and it's bleak. Um, and yet, there's quite a, a redemptive um, end to the novel. Ultimately, the boy's father dies. Well, that doesn't sound very redemptive, does it? But not for reassuring his son that he can talk to him in prayer after he's gone and that he must continue to live without him. In the final pages of the novel, the solitary boy is approached by a man carrying a shotgun who has a wife and two children, a boy and a girl. And the man convinces the, boys, the boy that he's one of the good guys and takes him under his protection. And as I say, somewhat unexpectedly, the novel ends with a thin sliver of hope. And I think, actually, if we're interested in reading whether it's scripture or fiction, Thin slivers of hope are incredibly important. I think selecting any short list of literature is, is a bit like selecting, um, and I think this is what Julie mentioned this a little bit earlier, eight, you know, those eight records. I don't know how many of you have got that in oh, my changes too, that's not my change, but I have an eight, eight, eight disc selection in my head um, for Desert Island Discs. Um, I don't know whether everybody still listens to that, but I love it. Um, and the books, I think, books, literature needs to be like pebbles in a pond, doesn't it? They need to create ripples. And that could be, as I've illustrated very briefly there, in terms of memories and associations. And they need to be, of course, beautifully crafted. I think the thing about reading literature with young people in a classroom is if you're going to read it lots and lots of times, you need to make sure that you're going to get lots and lots from it. You don't want the equivalent of literary fast food um, if you're going to be marooned on a desert island or if you're going to be studying it over again with students in the classroom. And of course, you want to be inspired. I think what also defines uh, all of the literature on that little list, and as I said, it's not fixed, it changes. I mean, I adore Shakespeare, I love poetry, 
Um, and it, it, it is enormously difficult to choose. But on that little short list, I think one of the things they have in common is that they ex explore questions about what it is to be human. And that's where the links between what we read and the value of that in terms of our understanding of faith comes into focus. I think whilst not overtly Christian in their context or in their intent, the works of fiction I've just mentioned are sustaining and inspiring because they do require us to consider issues of good and evil. Uh, perhaps of forgiveness and redemption. And of, for me, I think this is interesting too, I think there's a thread there, the enduring power of love. I'm, I'm not talking about sentimentality, I'm talking about deep, often difficult, self-sacrificing love. Um, but where is Lent in all of this? Well, when I was originally asked to contribute to the lecture series, my first thought was to set, select a single text uh, which might effectively explore some of the key themes relating directly to Lent. But one novel that jumped quickly to mind was Joanne Harris's Chocolat. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you have read it, but it's interesting. I mean, it's tiny, isn't it? An example of popular modern fiction. I dismissed it perhaps as too light to earn a place in the lecture with the title inspired by literature. And yet it's fair to say that it's not only those titles which appear on the literary canon um, as part of our kind of revered history in terms of literature that have the power to inspire. So for reasons which will become apparent, I decided that I would say a little more about Cooper. I don't, if you've not read the book, I could, the harm suggests that some of you have, you may have seen the film. Now, I think they're quite different beasts, actually. Um, uh, I've always struggled with film versions of things that I've enjoyed reading. They never quite come up to scratch, um, and that doesn't either for me. I think it, it tends to go for the easy wins, doesn't it? Anyway, the book opens with the arrival in the small French village, lancenay sous town of Vaillant Rocher, a single mother with a young daughter. The two arrive on Shrove Tuesday, well that's handy, and then they great. And just as the inhabitants are clearing away the remnants of the carnival, which immediately precedes the start to Lent. It's not without significance that the mother and daughter are moved to a disused bakery situated opposite the church. The church where the young opinionated curé of the parish, Francis Reynaud, leads his flock. And from the outset, Renault views the arrival of the rather exotic figure of Vianne with suspicion. And it's suspicion that quickly blossoms into outright disapproval as he realises that she intends to open a chocolate shop, which will surely serve to tempt churchgoers to overindulge and to encourage them to stray from abstinence and self-denial. Well, what follows may be, I think, quite simplistically um, describes the power struggle between the two characters. And that's for the hearts and minds of the villagers, or perhaps for good and evil. <laughs> Vianne is almost bewitching, and certainly she's unorthodox, and this serves to undermine the foundations of very nice, tight and carefully ordered community. And as Easter approaches, that community becomes bitterly divided. The power of the past, establishment, religious dogma, guilt and self-denial are all pitched against by an spellbinding, laissez-faire, egalitarian and indulgent um, influence. It shakes everybody up. I think in Chocolat, faith with a small f, that's represented with the belief or trust in the goodness of others and love, appear to be set apart from religion. So popular fiction it may be, but it is rattling our, our um, thoughts around in terms of those, those key themes. Francis Ringer knows the rules of his religion, but his version of Catholicism is distorted and barren because it lacks love. The leader of the village's religious community places his faith in what he understands to be God's rules as opposed to in God himself. I think surely having read the gospel accounts of Jesus' encounters with religious leaders and teachers of his day, that message strikes a chord in us. Reno never expresses his love for his flock. 
Instead, he focuses upon their sins and their shortcomings and becomes obsessed with trying to control them. He claims, I want to guide them, to free them from their sin, but they fight me at every turn. He hears their confessions, but it is Bayan who listens to their hearts. Convenient as it is to be able to refer at this time to a text so firmly rooted in the season of Lent, we need to be careful not to claim Harris's message here as being overtly Christian. Bayan has faith in humanity and any amount of love but she doesn't champion the cause of any kind of formal religious thinking or tradition. Quite the opposite. Indeed, she celebrates pagan holidays and encourages her daughter to do likewise. She loves mythology and stories of spirits and witches. Well, that's so few and not do. Whatever your views about Harris's underlying motives in creating these two characters, <coughs> perhaps it doesn't matter. The people and places in the novel just don't exist. So of what substance and relevance can that possibly be? They're entertainment, that's all. Nothing more. Now here we come to what I think is a more interesting um, question underpinning um, what I'm saying to you this evening. Why look at literature, in particular fiction, for inspiration? Stories are not true. Therefore, what light can they possibly shed upon issues about our religion and our faith? I can remember having conversations as a child with my father, and he was not a great lover of art. He liked photography. He was definitely not a lover of poetry. He read or, or fiction, for that matter. He was a man who consumed prose. And he and I would argue about it. And he would say, well, you know, if you want to see something, see a photographer, see the real thing. Same thing with fiction. To read fiction, I want to see the real thing. He didn't actually understand that we can draw a great deal from fiction and from beautiful paintings. Um, he wasn't a philistine as such, but he was a very difficult man to judge on that subject. <laughs> the problem here is with that word true. When we dismiss a work of fiction, just as my dad dismissed paintings and, and poetry and fiction as not true, what we're actually what we actually ought to be saying is that it's not factual. That's okay, I can accept that. Just because something is not factual, it does not follow that it lacks truths to teach us. And here I come to a little book, I know I think um, Julie's uh, seen it before, but it was, um, some of you may be familiar with it. It's a little um, book by Hilary Brand. It's called Christ and the Shop Lettering. And I, I want to read a couple of short paragraphs to you from this. It's actually, it, it doesn't deal with the novel, it deals with the film. It's quite light and entertaining, but it's also an interesting little perspective on Lent alongside the film. But she says this, Suppose you were asked to write a history of your church. You wouldn't find it difficult to write the facts. Number in the congregation, the different activities, names of leaders, etc. You probably wouldn't find it too difficult to write the good things. We've had an alpha of course. Uh, we've built a new church hall. We take our kids away to camp. But quite probably, and quite rightly, you would find it hard to be totally honest. What about the difficult things? The tensions between the vicar and the August. The time Miss, Mrs. Farberson got off offended and walked out. The youth leader who left his wife for a fling with brown owl. <laughs> if you were writing fiction, however, I hope you did some homework before I read that out. <laughs> I didn't. If you were writing fiction, however, you could explore these things. You could examine how the youth lead ached for some human warmth. What there was in Mrs. Farkinson's childhood that made her so difficult. How the vicar went home at night and wept with frustration at trying to keep everyone happy. It might well be a far truer account of how things really are in your church, with a safe but accurate history that doesn't hurt anyone. So, far from being something we should dismiss as irrelevant, fiction
Shown has a great deal to offer in terms of enabling the reader to explore things which are hard. And we do, we do it when we're reading fiction or poetry or whatever, we do it on neutral ground. And I think this links with Aristotle's notion of catharsis, a word which means literally purification or purging. If we follow Aristotle's line of thought, it's possible to conclude that as readers, when we identify with a story, we are provided with a safe place in which to draw out and examine buried feelings, anger, pain, fear, lust, love, greed, which if they were allowed to erupt or surface in another context, would be quite harmful, not to say dangerous. In short, I think fiction allows us to grapple with the human condition at a safe distance. The issues we might examine or the questions we might ask ourselves, for instance, prompted by reading Chocoba, could look something like this. If a stranger turned up in your church, what messages would they get about Christianity? Or what can we learn from the novel about self-denial? Or perhaps, is Vianne a brave freedom fighter or a sinister and subversive destroyer of traditional values? Or perhaps more profoundly, what damage is done by a life that is safe, secure, and calm? According to Aristotle's logic, novels and poems, far from being dismissed on the basis that they're not true, could and should be viewed as great starting points for exploring big issues about God, the world, and what it means to be human. And as a teacher in a church in England school, this resonates very well with me. Ideas about God, faith, and the human condition do not reside solely in the RE lesson, or in the, indeed in the school assembly hall. Where better to do some of that exploration than in the classrooms in which we're reading and studying fiction, drama, and poetry? So that brings me nicely to our students who've kindly given up their time this evening to share some of their thinking on the subject. When we discussed what we might wish to say to you, I asked both Jacob and Florence to consider one or two of the big issues about God, religion, the world, and what it means to be human that have emerged from their study of literature at school. Uh, Flo is going to share with you her reflection on some, some of the poetry of Christina Rossetti. I know you had a little leaflet. I said, Florence, you can sort of test it. <coughs> but I know Flo would like to refer to a couple of those things. So, Flo, we're ready to hand over to you, please. Um, I'd first like to just introduce myself. I'm Flo. Uh, I'm a Year 13 A-level English Literature student, and I hope to study English at university next year. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity, really, to discuss the poetry of Christina Rossetti. As Mrs. Stevens has already said, Rossetti was a Victorian poet operating in the mid 1800s. You may have already heard of her, but if you haven't, you would probably be familiar with her poem, In the Bleak Midwinter, which has now evolved into a classic Christmas carol. However, I'm more interested in her work, which challenges the notions of identity, womanhood, and gender roles in Victorian society, but also about religion and its relationship with society. Faith is both, both debated personally and politically, as Rossetti considers her turbulent relationship with God. However, before I go on to speak about her poetry itself, I think it's important to unpack the contemporary religious context of Rossetti's time and where her faith originated from. Rossetti, along with her mother and sister, were members of a high Anglican church, specifically the Christ Church in Albany Street in London, which is where Rossetti and uh, the Rossetti women worshipped at, was linked to the Oxford movement. Uh, which was a secret ritualistic religious society. This sort of secrecy behind religion, I think, is reflected in her multi-layered poetry, which is rich with metaphor, symbolism, and hidden meaning. Her faith, uh, may I also add, also originated during her adolescence, at a time when her family was threatened with illness and financial difficulties. 
When there was not security at home, Rossetti found security in God instead. I certainly think this sense of comfort and salvation Rossetti found in God shines through in her poem twice. It's on the front page. The speaker puts their trust in a man who promises her love and devotion, yet ultimately abandons her, declaring her heart to still be unripe. Instead, she puts her trust in God, and, as the line in the penultimate stanza declares, I shall not die, but live. This shows her ultimate salvation through faith. The poem's two distinct halves, marked by a change from past to present tense, further shows God's superior benevolence in comparison to human romantic love, which appears to be wavering, inconsistent, and easily breakable. I also want to pick up about the issue twice raises about the double standards and the idea of womanhood in the Victorian era. As the title of the poem alludes to, to be a woman in Victorian times often meant being judged twice. First by man, and then by God. <clears throat> Rossetti, perhaps then, only felt listened to or appreciated for who she was by God. I must stress, however, that I am very reluctant to label Rossetti's work as a proto-feminist. She was a vocal opposer of the suffrage movement and therefore almost definitely would have disagreed with that label. However, she does dissect gender roles and women's position in society further in From the Antique. I think that might be... On this page. Um, the poem begins with, it's a weary life it is, she said. Doubly blank in a woman's lot. The speaker then wants to describe their apparent insignificance in the world, miserably concluding, still, the world would wag on the same without them. Rossetti operated in a patriarchal society, and it would be at least another 50 years until women gained the vote. And instead they were reduced to domestic and motherhood roles in the Victorian age. So essentially, from the antique, gives a voice to the forgotten women in their society. This implied social political commentary, however, is also shaped by Rossetti's desire to reach an equilibrium between her religious devotion and social obligations. Through her poetry, Rossetti constantly questions how she can invest in romantic relationships without damaging her faith. And there seems to be no final answer. Rossetti rejected three proposals in her lifetime all due to religious differences. Perhaps then, this loneliness seen in From the Antique is also due to feeling unable to fulfill her designated role as a wife, wife and mother, as Victorian society dictates. Now this marks a long start, the start of a long contradictory inner conflict Rosetti wrestles with, torn between religious devotion and social pressures. So, evidently, Rossetti's relationship with her faith was never simple or unquestioning. Her writings show her constantly interrogating religious ideas and beliefs, often with a degree of tension and anxiety as she seeks to find reassurance that might never come. Perhaps her frustration is best shown through reading one of her poems, and I would now like to share with you a reading of Good Friday. Am I a stone and not a sheep, that I can stand, O Christ, beneath thy cross, to number, drop by drop, thy blood's slow loss, and yet not weep? Not so those women who loved, who with exceeding grief lamented thee. Not so fallen Peter, weeping bitterly. Not so the thief was moved. Not so the sun and the moon, which hid their faces in the starless sky. A horror of great darkness at broad noon. I, only I. Yet not give over, but seek thy sheep, true shepherd of the flock. Greater than Moses, turn and look once more 
and smite a rock. The speaker's frustration is evident as they question why they can stand over the crucified Christ, a powerful, arguably defining image of Christianity, yet cannot produce an emotional response. Evidently, Rossetti knows Christianity inside out, yet the poem shows that knowledge doesn't automatically lead to feeling God's power. It appears that no matter how many times you pray, attend the church, um, or study the Bible, these actions will have no spiritual impact if you do not have emotional investment behind them. Rossetti, therefore, is at a crisis point. Yet, no matter how detached she feels from God, she remains undeterred. As the poem says, she vows to turn and look once more and smite a rock. Comparing herself to Moses, attempting to get water out of a stone in the Old Testament, emphasises to readers that faith and sustaining a deep, meaningful relationship with God is not easy. This uphill struggle is represented quite literally in the poem called Uphill. Whilst God is presented as benevolent, providing a bed for all who come, there is still an inner struggle to reach this power paradise, which was that he yearns for so desperately. So, what can we, modern day readers, glean from Rossetti's conflict regarding religion and her place in the world. What is the true meaning behind her multi-layered symbolic poetry? Certainly, we don't face the, the challenges Rossetti faced, female suffrage gained women the vote, and the Victorian gender ideals are, to a certain extent, no longer applicable today. Yet, Rossetti's complex contradictory relationship with religion is a reassuring message for all of those struggling with their own faith. In a time of Lent, when our resilience is challenged constantly with temptation, this is even more applicable. Rossetti, despite all her inner conflict surrounding her belief, her gender and her place in society, persevered nevertheless. And I think we should all take strength from that. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Claire has been, in, in, I think she's given us a lovely insight into the way that young people, when they encounter literature in the classroom and have to study it, um, are prepared to grapple with really difficult things. And um, with great deal of success, I think it's been really interesting to leading us into that sort of thinking toward um, intimate level with text this evening. And I also think she's been very modest. Um, uh, she's actually going off to Cambridge to read English literature, <laughs> Murray Edwards um, College. So I think you've got to visit, you're visiting tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so they're visiting tomorrow, where there will be so much opportunity to do some more grappling with talented texts. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to wait until year 13 start doing that much sooner and to illustrate how that similar kind of process is undertaken in year 11 is Jacob. He's going to talk about one of his GCSE texts. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> my name is Jacob and I'm 16. I will be taking my GCSEs at the end of this academic year and I hope to take English lit Literature as a sixth form next year. So, in GCSE English, I'm studying an Inspector Coles. It's a play written in 1945 by a socialist called J.B. Priestley. <laughs> For any who don't know the story, and I expect lots of you probably do, um, a police inspector interrupts an engagement party to question the partygoers about a case of suicide. A young woman called Ava Smith has drunk a bottle of disinfectants and died. Now, it turns out that each of the five people at the party has played a negative part in the circumstances surrounding her death. 
Arthur the Burn, the father, fired her from his factory because she asked for higher wages. His daughter, Sheila, was jealous of Ada's natural beauty, and because of this jealousy, she had her fired from her next job. Sheila's fiancé, Gerald, kept Ava as his own private mistress, but then dropped her back into prostitution when he finished with her. And while drunk, Sheila's brother, Eric, got Ava pregnant against her will. Finally, <laughs> their mother, Sybil, destroyed Ava's last hope of charitable aid because Ava referred to herself as Mrs. Burley. However, despite the title and the rather complex plot, this isn't a detective play. It's about people. Now, Priestley wasn't a religious man. Uh, nevertheless, the message he shares in this play is actually very similar to that of the Bible. Throughout the play, the playwright emphasizes that we're all a community. We're all mixed up together like bees in a hive. And we need to think about more than just our own welfare. So Priestley used the play in order to make his audiences change their social attitudes. He wanted them to realize that everyone in society has a duty of care to each other. In other words, he's asking everyone to love your neighbor as yourself. During the play, the inspector revealed that all of the guests were guilty, to some extent. They each had a negative impact on Ava's quality of life. Now, at first, Gerald challenged the inspector about this. He didn't want to get caught up in all of this. So, he said, after all, you know, we're respectable citizens and not criminals. Now to this, the inspector smoothly replies, sometimes there isn't as much difference as you think. <laughs> this wasn't just aimed at Gerald. I think this is Priestley talking to all of us. No one is blameless. We all make mistakes. We all fall short of perfection. And Priestley asks us here to examine ourselves. Now, there aren't always direct analogues between 1945 and now, but there are some things that I think are particularly relevant today. Do we treat our employees fairly? Do we buy responsibly? Or do we overlook slave labour overseas? Because it allows us to get cheap products. And do we protect our planet to the best of our ability? Or do we allow laziness to stop us from doing the right thing? I think we can all agree that it isn't always easy to do the right thing. And Gerald's character is an excellent illustration of this. Through him, Priestley shows us that good and bad actions aren't always black and white. When Ada Smith became Gerald's mistress, he did improve her situation for a time. However, when it became inconvenient for him to keep her, he stopped supporting her financially and ended the relationship. So this returned her to her previous situation, but with added emotional turmoil. It feels awful when you think someone cares about you, but then they just discard you like an empty sweet wrapper. So, although Gerald temporarily helped her, it was for his own convenience. And it ended up making matters worse for Ava. Because Ava's pain was emotional rather than physical, this meant that Gerald didn't feel remorse for his actions, because 
Well, he didn't feel like he'd done anything wrong. Now, it's interesting to notice that the only characters who do show remorse and they accept responsibility and repent were the two youngest, Eric and Sheila. Now, I suggest that Priestley wanted us to be open to having our self perceptions challenged, as children do, to learn. There is a very clear analogy here with Matthew 18, verse 4. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we need to return to a childlike state and have the humility to let other people teach us. However, the fact that young people are often more open to influence than many adults is a double-edged sword in today's world of reality TV and social media, which encourage teenagers to focus on image and followers rather than substance and friendships. And although some of my peers complain about having to study a provocatively moral text like Anne Spectacles, I think it's invaluable. So much of our modern culture encourages people to think only about themselves, that it's, well, it's important to read something that encourages us to consider other people. There are plenty of celebrities who set awful examples for people my age. And I think, in contrast, the inspector in Anne Spectacles is designed to be a positive role model. Thinking more about the inspector, I think he is easily the most puzzling character in the entire play. To emphasize this, Priestley deliberately chose his name Inspector Ghoul, because spectres and ghouls are both sorts of ghosts or spirits. <laughs> and different people interpret him as an angel, a Christ-like figure, or even a shared hallucination. But to me, Priestley has given the inspector three attributes that stand out. Power, love, and self-control. Sheila recognised his power when she warned her family, you mustn't try and build up a kind of wall between us and that girl. If you do, the inspector will only break it down. And the inspector shows that he has love when he says, I've often thought that it would do us all a bit of good if sometimes we try to put ourselves in the place of those young women counting their pennies in their dingy little back bedrooms. And finally, the inspector demonstrates his self-control in his stage directions. Now, there aren't an awful lot of them, but they include things like dryly and steadily and massively, which all show that he does have control not only of the situation, but of himself. Now, I expect you may recognise the three attributes of power, love and self-control, from 2 Timothy, verse 7. The spirit God gave us does not make us afraid. His spirit is a source of power and love and self-control. And I think that the inspector seems to draw his strength from this biblical source. Perhaps he could be a role model for Christians. <coughs> He seeks the truth. He challenges injustice when he sees it. And he spreads the same call to action that Jesus preached. He, he says this, but remember this, one Ava Smith has gone, but there are millions and millions and millions of Ava Smiths and John Smiths still left with us, with their lives, their hopes and fears, their suffering and chance of happiness, all intertwined with our lives and what we think and say and do. 
We don't live alone. We are members of one body. We are responsible for each other. And I tell you that the time will come soon when if men will not learn that lesson, then they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. Priestly adopts deliberately uh, quite a lot of biblical language in this passage. Uh, we are members of one body. I tell you, fire and blood and anguish, they all sound quite biblical to me. And I think he does this because he agrees with the Christian value of love. He knows that we're all better off when we love our neighbours as ourselves. Thank you. by thinking um, aloud about the importance of how we read and reflect on literature rather than the contents of what we read. I think that has an important part to play in terms of inspiring us. So every now and then when my husband and I visit Bath, we attend a Sunday morning service at Bath Abbey. And on the last Sunday before Lent, each member of the congregation there this year was invited to take away with them a booklet to support their journey through Lent. It contains copies of a selection of paintings which are held in the National Gallery. And the accompanying commentary invites contemplation on those images following the practice of visio divina, sacred seeing. Um, this is an ancient form of Christian prayer, but you're familiar with it, in which we allow our hearts and our imaginations to enter into an image in silence to see what God might have to say to us. I think the equivalent practice, well, no, the equivalent practice in relation to scriptures is known as Lectio Divina, in other words, sacred reading. Through this practice, which dates back to the early church fathers of around 300 AD, you're invited to follow four key steps reading, meditation, prayer, contemplation. And the practice is designed to encourage us to savour and manoeuvre. God's words quietly and slowly and intently. The reader has the space to respond to what he or she feels God is saying, to consider how God's word applies to their daily lives, to have the opportunity for an intimate time of communion with God. Now, I'm not asserting that studying literature in school or at university has a sacred function. But the practice of reading a text slowly and carefully, of meditating upon what we've read and deepening our appreciation of what is written, just as we've seen illustrated this evening, in order to explore its riches, that resonates with me as a teacher. I was not aware of Lectio Divina when I embarked upon my career in the classroom the best part of 40 years ago. But these key elements are fundamental to the way in which I believe young people should be encountering what the poetry and novels they read in school. It's not all about exam papers. What a waste that would be. If the literature in question has things to say about God, the world, and what it means to be human, albeit in the form of fiction as opposed to fact, then there is the potential to move and inspire. And to all of this, I'd like to add one last footnote. In Samuel Wells' book, A Nazareth Manifesto, he asserts that the fundamental human problem is not mortality, though overcoming that takes up a great deal of our creative, economic, and, and technological enterprise. Instead, he claims that the fundamental human problem is isolation. 
He says this, as a result of enhanced transport, communication and information technologies, which have made it possible to communicate in ever more extensive and complex ways, we have facilitated lifestyles where people are in touch with conversation partners on the other side of the planet, but not with next door neighbours. Where face-to-face -face human interaction is ceasing to become the encounter of choice for a generation who are used to having plentiful alternative ways to make themselves known to one another. The flip side of making ourselves more independent and self-sufficient is that we're simultaneously becoming more isolated and more alone. My point is this. The contents of great literature, or even fairly mediocre fiction, undoubtedly have the potential to inspire us, to enrich our lives, and to deepen our understanding of what it means to live a more godly life. But in addition to that inspiration, given that we as humans are innately social creatures, the manner in which we encounter literature also has a fundamental importance. I would argue that the collective face-to-face -face experience of grappling with literature, the act of sharing it, talking about it, of combing through it, contemplating its meaning together in a real as opposed to a virtual classroom or in a church hall acts as a critical antidote to isolation and it must be championed. But ladies and gentlemen, I think that's the title of a whole new lecture. So, <laughs> I'm so grateful to you for listening to us this evening. We've enjoyed talking to you, haven't we? Great, thank you very much.
It was interesting when you said um, film versus book. Yes. Because for many years, I've watched many adaptations of a very old classic book that I've just, just read. And the irony this time around was I felt very anticlimactic when I got to the end of the book because I'm so used to the sensationalised adaptations and it was Bram Stoker's. Ah, oh, right. Wasn't it? <laughs> At the very end. But I wonder if you've ever come across any that you're quite pleased with the adaptation in, in the film. Mm. I don't care. I, I don't think actually. That's the practice. It's yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I do practice. enough if you haven't read it and and um but yeah so it was just like but then i revisited the film the other day after finally and i'm like i haven't seen it because i've read the book in a different mindset and uh, so it's like but just at the end of the actual book i was like <laughs> but yeah yeah so it was, it was interesting I mean, having I mean, been affected before i'd read it if you see a great adaptation, of, of a film adaptation of any of Shakespeare's works, I, I, I mean, that just brings everything off the page, doesn't it? it, it and I, I, they always give me joy, so I, I wouldn't argue with that. I mean, obviously, it's lovely to have the written words, too. Oh, it's yeah, also yeah. fantastic to see it, so I, I can enjoy that. I fall asleep most of the time in front of the television, as my husband can tell you. I'm not, I'm not much better in a cinema either, so, uh, so that's I'm not the best person to ask. But I think if I was having to make a choice, I'd say anything by Shakespeare. I'm rarely disappointed um, because people lift it off the page. And, and the other thing is, and that brings young people to it, I think. You know, Always celebrate that. <laughs> Do you find ever, um, Beverly, that when you are forced to engage with a piece of literature in teaching, um, it can be, it can destroy your inspiration of that piece of literature? Because one of the things that you find, I don't know, I, I only speak for myself as a member of the clergy, but when you go to theological college. Um, you have to analyse certain bits of the Bible so much that it can destroy any sort of idea of poetry or inspiration that you might get for it, from it. And it takes years to get back to seeing the, the inspiration behind it because you're, you're analysing it as a piece of literature rather than engaging with it emotionally because yeah. you're meant to be emotionally detached when you're, you know, you're analysing an Inspector Calls, for yeah. example. I, I, I take your point entirely, and I can certainly remember. I mean, I absolutely love the poetry of Robert Frost, but when I studied it at school, it felt very reductive because you were taking it apart. Yes. You can drive a beautiful car and really enjoy the journey, can't you? But I don't really want to get my head under the bonnet. Mm -hmm. um, um, and and uh, I think sometimes a first reading that where something really speaks to you. And then, but, but I, you, you can't stop yourself doing it. Once you've started to do that, yeah. that becomes your modus operandi. So once something has, I've enjoyed it, it's given me joy, then I want to work out where that came from and get my head onto the planet. Um, but I can understand why for young people sometimes it can be quite alienating because they haven't had the chance to just enjoy the drive. Yeah. First, have they? We've made them get the lid up on yes. this. <laughs> Just going back to my early days of school, I was a poet who was uh, written upon a blackboard and it was an A to handwriting and memory. Yes. <laughs> Not too much about uh, in-depth analysis, I don't think. Yeah. Would, what, what's your view on learning poetry? Do you think it's a good idea? Um, well, uh, well, I don't I don't need to call the English public speaking more anymore. <coughs> um, I think it's very difficult to teach English in school. It's very difficult to teach English in school. 
I can remember my son doing this. They had to learn poetry. Poetry is meant to be spoken. Um, and that's where some of that joy that we just talked about comes from, hearing <coughs> it. Um, so I think it's a great to be. If you just mechanically, I, I can remember this happening when I was in guides at school. And I can remember a girl standing up on stage, and I only remember the first few lines. She said, the nicest boy I ever knew was Charles Augustus Fortescue. <laughs> and she read the whole thing like that and killed the poet. <laughs> I just say, so take your choice. <laughs> Carefully learned, lyrically learned, it would be a fantastic thing. Um, and of course, that's, that's, as, as we've just said, that's what poetry is all about. We should hear it and feel it. You've got some lovely questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Two o'clock. so that will give us another benefit from what we've heard tonight and anyone is most welcome to come to that but on your way out there are two things this evening um, as normal there is a tray um, and your donations towards expenses would be greatly appreciated but there is also this evening a bookstore with books from Quench which Carolyn is looking after so if you have a moment before you go do have a look at that could I thank, as before, all those who uh, helped organise this evening, the stewards and the people who did the refreshments, Julian, who's uh, handled the uh, recording. Is it running out of battery? Just no, as no, I come no, to it's, it's connected to the power, so we're OK. <laughs> so thank you for that. And as you probably know, next week, uh, all being well, the um, Bishop of Chelmsford, Stephen Cottrell, will be here, inspired by art. So once again, to all three of you, Thank you very much. Thank you.